All right. Thank you, Redbeard. I think uh, Redbeard is one of the choreos, that's what we call ourselves, uh, that I think embodies CoreOS in a person as much as anybody. So thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I'd like to say first, uh, just like Redbeard, welcome. This is an exciting event for us uh, and I think represents uh, an early community of um, companies and individuals that are adopting uh, this emerging set of technology. Um, so in a second, I'm going to ask you to say hello to each other, something that I love happens at all conferences. But I, I think it's, it's important because this group represents um, the set of companies that are either already adopted uh, Kubernetes and containers or are about to. And I think it really represents the current state of the market as well um, in a very pure, um, clean way. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background um, about what we are doing. So CoreOS is our company and our plan here is to dramatically improve the security of the internet. And that is based around really two um, core ideas. The first is that a huge chunk of the issues that are out there relate to just the fact that people don't update their software. Um, if you just updated to the latest, most secure versions, uh, that has all sorts of benefits. It also is related to the fact that there's this asymmetry between uh, the attackers who can automatically write programs to hack these things, but we can't write programs to automatically fix it. And it's this sort of model that we are trying to change and why we've been shepherding along this whole ecosystem over the past three, three and a half years now. This ecosystem of distributed systems, containers, you know, this whole model of infrastructure management that we believe is a design dependency in order to achieve this mission. And so to do that, we've released a number of open source projects. We believe that open source is a key aspect of dramatically accelerating change uh, in infrastructure. And so the first uh, major one that we released is our Linux distribution. Um, so to kick things off, have a bit of announcement about that. We have renamed our Linux distribution, which is formerly known as CoreOS Linux, to Container Linux. We've done this um, to decouple it from our corporate brand, um, as we've seen it becoming um, quite a ubiquitous part of, of the, the movement that's happening right now. Um, so much so um, that we're now seeing around a million instances per month um, coming online around um, container Linux. Uh, and this is a pretty big milestone and we believe represents a decent chunk of the internet at this point, at least a piece, a meaningful part. And so every time when we go and service an update, a new feature, or a new, um, a new security patch, um, we are touching a huge chunk of the web, and we wanted to make sure that this open source and this infrastructure continues to become just basic plumbing on the web. Um, just wanted to call out what this means. So CoreOS is our company, and then we have developed a set of open source projects in-house, and we continue to, to contribute to projects that aren't our own as well, things like Kubernetes and the Linux kernel and so on. But these are a suite of just a few of the open source projects um, that we've built to date. So, why is this all important? So who here has heard of Dirty Cow about a month ago? Yeah, Dirty Cow? All right, Dirty Cow is a root privilege escalation bug that came out about what, four or five weeks ago. Um, this is, uh, again, I think it's so funny that in 2016 we give our vulnerabilities logos and stickers and names, they've gotten so bad. Um, but if you've heard of Dirty Cow, you might not have heard of the 13 other vulnerabilities that have come out um, since then. All of these issues are ones that would cause an operations team to stop what they're doing in that moment and have to go fix that. Um, they, it's a fire drill that every individual operations team in the world is supposed to be on top of and to go and fix, otherwise you're leaving your, your infrastructure insecure. And so when we started building uh, Container Linux, the idea and sort of central tenant is that if we can automatically in software migrate you through these versions, um, your company will no longer have to fire drill around that. Um, additionally, beyond the security fixes, just having the latest version of software has a bunch of benefits. 
Um, we think that Docker has been central to the adoption of all of this, um, but we also believe that having the latest version of Linux um, available to run containers in has also been central to the adoption of Docker itself. Um, having the latest version is required um, in order to get access to things like the central uh, mechanisms that, that drive uh, containers themselves. Wanted to spend a minute just talking about how this is different than the existing models of building Linux distributions. Uh, so in the middle there, we have upstream Linux kernel, um, specifically the stable branch of Linux. Uh, above, we have container Linux, and below, I'm referring to um, RHEL. So what happens upstream is a patch is developed for security purposes or just a new feature and so on. Um, that patch gets tested and discussed um, by the upstream Linux kernel community, and then that lands in um, the upstream stable branch at some point. What we do with container Linux is we, we pull that in um, pretty much directly off of that stable branch. And since we're not running any sort of forked or branched version of it, we are able to incorporate it with zero backporting um, and, and ship it out instantly. And our trick here is that because we have a rapid delivery model, we're able to iterate on this very, very quickly in the same model that you'd see like a, a you know, CI CD system in production web infrastructure. In the Red Hat model, um, which uh, we love our friends at Red Hat, I'm not saying it's better or worse, I'm just saying it's different, um, is that patch gets pulled um, and backported to their branch, and it gets retested and recertified and then rolled out again. And that's why you see a dramatic amount of time between uh, when these things are available uh, in upstream and when they're available down in the, in the enterprise branch that Red Hat maintains. I'll just re-articulate this. You know, there's our model patches it directly or pulls it directly in because we are essentially just running upstream and our key difference is the delivery model itself. And this, this cycle continues as there's always more features, more patches, more security issues, and so on. We continue to move this forward. We call this model um, self-driving infrastructure because the software itself knows how to update to that latest version. And we believe that that iteration, that cycle, is what allows us to be so tightly coupled to upstream. And that's what makes Container Linux, therefore, a, a self-driving Linux distribution, and really the first of its kind on the um, server side. We've seen this in phones, we've seen this in I mean, Chromebooks have a similar model to this, but we've never seen this before um, in a Linux distribution. It's also distinctly different than really all the other container Linuxes that have come out since we originally released this. So in order to make all of this work in the first place, distributed systems are required. That's why when we uh, shipped container Linux initially, we also shipped etcd. Etcd has become a central tenant to this emerging distributed systems container infrastructure. Every, um, every one of these orchestration systems that's come out has a dependency on etcd in some form. Um, Kubernetes itself, every single Kubernetes cluster in the world uses etcd. And the reason that this is important um, is because it allows us to do a couple important things. First, distributed systems give us a safety net for bad updates. If we are able to ship software in an environment where we can break part of the system, but it continues to work, that is uh, what is required to do this safely. We're not saying we'll never ship a bad issue, but we will ship a bad issue in an environment that can accept it. And that's one of the core problems um, with the way we run infrastructure today, is that if you break one little thing, the rest of the system goes down and everything's on fire. In a distributed system, if you break one little thing, it's okay, the software automatically moves it around and self heals. So that leads us to the second major thing I want to talk about, which is now um, Tectonic is self-driving Kubernetes. So we've applied this concept that we've done with container Linux and proven to work um, at extremely high degree of scale, and now we're releasing it for Kubernetes itself, for the whole distributed cluster. Why is this important? Very similar story to our little Linux distribution. Um, 1.4.2 and everything below contained a security bug um, that every IT department, every operations team in the world should drop what they're doing and go and fix if they're running Kubernetes. An interesting side effect here is if you're running Kubernetes 
that also is affected by dirty cow, this would be a perfect way to do a pretty big exploit. You would first compromise through Kubernetes, and then you would go root the kernel uh, through the dirty cow bug. So these chained together. They came out on the same day. Um, this one didn't get a name, um, and it also sort of exposed some of the early security issues um, with just the community in general, or the community around Kubernetes about handling of these types of security things. Um, and so we didn't have self-driving Kubernetes yet, and so the, the best that we could do is write documentation about how to upgrade and notify as many people as we can. But now that we do, um, we'll be able to automatically remediate these issues without any operator intervention. There's actually some code there with the bug. <laughs> That's the fix, actually. Pesky, you have to call verify. Dang. <laughs> All right. So in Tectonic, even before we had this, we've been very aggressive about continuing to stay up to date on everything. Um, you'll see these are the major releases of, um, of Kubernetes and where we ship them with Tectonic. Again, with Tectonic, just like we are with Linux, who we're shipping the pure upstream version. Um, and we've averaged, I believe it's about 22 days lagging um, on the major uh, version releases. We'll be talking about this in a minute, David from Google, um, but 1.5 is coming soon, uh, if not today. And this is yet another example to exercise this type of system. Again, very similar story. In this case, we're talking about Tectonic versus OpenShift and upstream Kubernetes. With 1.5, you know, we're going to be able to pull that in directly off of master as soon as it's certified upstream. We do our own testing, of course, and put it through the alpha beta stable testing model. Um, and then we'll be able to deliver it to our customers extremely quickly. The OpenShift model, there'll be a phase of backporting and testing to those branches um, in order to get it. Uh, and we believe that, that this, this will dramatically accelerate the adoption of Kubernetes as well. So overall, why why does this matter? Well, we want to keep it secure. We want to make the latest features and security issues really simple to adopt and just keep you current. Because the current branch is the, is the best place to be. And then how are, how are companies working with us? Well, it's this nice cycle that we have going on here. So we take upstream Kubernetes. Tectonic delivers it down to you uh, in this self-driving model. Um, you put it uh, in your environment, you might discover you want some feature requests or you have bugs that are specific to your environment or maybe even your team discovers a security issue uh, and they can work with our, our Kubernetes team which is contributing directly back up into upstream. Um, as soon as we push to upstream, again, then it gets delivered again and it's this virtuous cycle that both um, helps your environment and promotes the use of upstream open source software. So self-driving capability is available today. It is similar to uh, you know, when they turned on autopilot in your Tesla. Uh, you might still want to keep your hands on the wheel, um, but you can push the button. Um, and we're also now making Tectonic available up to 10 nodes uh, for anybody to go out and download and try, uh, which before uh, today, you'd need to go through our team in order to get access to it. Um, so you can go out under the website, get the bits, and if you so choose, turn on this new capability, um, which we're, we're experimenting with for the first time today. So with that, I'd like to thank you all again. Um, and now we'll be hearing from our latest Tectonic customer, Ticketmaster, um, who's been a great partner with us so far. And I would like to welcome Justin. Justin.